Waiting does not equal bad news. Waiting does not equal bad news. Waiting does not equal. I've been waiting for a month for test results, a mammogram, then another, and now a biopsy. And I get the call. They want me to come in. The first thing my doctor tells me is, Nancy, we've got some work to do. What the fuck? <laughs> what? I expected him to be direct. Use the words, breast cancer. We've got work to do? Hold on, wait a minute. Uh, what are you trying to tell me? What? Now, now, Nancy, you're an English teacher. Have you seen that play, Wit? In the play, a witchy woman dies of breast cancer, but she's spared enough time to realize how she's ruined her life because she hasn't been more compassionate to others. Dies of breast cancer. Dies. Fucking A. <laughs> I hadn't seen it. <laughs> Can you just read me the path report, please? Ductal carcinoma in situ rest right breast. Oh. Before I leave, he tears off a prescription sheet with work to do, make appointments with three doctors, set up tests. I get in my car and stare at the prescription sheet. I can feel my fingers shaking on the steering wheel. I'm already late to work. I start up the block, but then I pull into a parking lot. My phone's in my hand, and I take a moment. <laughs> my husband, Don, is probably on a ladder, wrapping up a painting job on a busy Friday morning. I've been married to him for 29 years since, excuse me, I've been married to him for 20 plus years since he was 29. And in a month, we'll throw his 50th birthday party. I love this guy. I've been staring at his photo on my screensaver. This lanky guy's big hands wrapped around our dogs. He's still Midwest quiet and unassuming, dry humored, sometimes a little grumpy, but <laughs> after two plus decades together, the most rock steady, loving person I've known. He's top of my phone faves, and I tap my phone. <laughs> Hi, hon. Well, what'd he say? Well, he said the biopsy showed I, I do have breast cancer. It's in the milk duct. I can hear both of us breathing, then shuffling, some clanking, like maybe he's getting off the ladder with a paint bucket and walking. Well, where are you? I'm gonna meet you. I don't know, I'm in a parking lot. I, I, I just drove here from the office. I'm supposed to be at school. Well, well, just go home, I'll be there. Are you okay to drive? It's a gray, October, Friday morning in OB, and guys are already swinging 24 packs of beer to their cars in the lot. When people walk by, I lower my gaze to the car floor, piles of manila folders with school meeting notes, weekend essays, a couple of stained coffee cups. Yeah, well, I'm fine. I drive home thinking, I hope this doesn't change us. I wanna keep our life our lovemaking. How's this gonna work, seeing me naked, missing a breast? Then a few more weeks of waiting and it's November. We're going for the cure, Nancy, says my surgeon. Well, great, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd, I've read that you can never be completely sure you're cured. I could meet milestones, right? Like five years out, maybe 10 years. But it can come back. You're a survivor until you're not, I guess. He says, there's choices. He explains how younger women choose lumpectomy with radiation because it is breast preserving and the odds of longevity can be the same as doing a mastectomy. With the mastectomy option, if the path report comes back clean after the mastectomy, I could be done. No radiation and no chemo. I leave his office 
and I head next door to the plastic surgeons, but I just walk on past and I go to the bathroom. I feel like barfing. I splash water on my face. No paper towels. There's one of these high-tech dryers, those ones that sound like jet engines, right? <laughs> I grab toilet paper. Thin gray pieces are stuck to my chin, to my forehead. I put on some lipstick, realizing I'm afraid. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to frickin' beat this thing. That's what I'm here for. I'll do whatever it takes, even if I have to lose a boob. <laughs> I stomp into the plastic surgeon's office. You know, you can bump up to a C cup while we're doing this thing. <laughs> while I'm at it means that at the time of the mastectomy alongside my surgeon, the plastic doc could upgrade my whole rack <laughs> by slipping a smaller implant into the healthy boob to give me that perky matching pair, he says. <laughs> they got a match. Well, I don't know too many women who do perfectly. Well, you're not going to like it in a few more years when the natural one is sagging and he drops his hand. And the one I give you is up here. <laughs> well, he's flipping through a binder full of boobs. He wants to show me <laughs> I have options. There's the rub-on nipples. There's the temporary tattoo. And well, I could get a real nipple from my own skin and a real tattoo of an areola around that nipple. Hey, my first tattoo. <laughs> I don't want to think about this shit, but I say, I'm not really sure, so I'm not going to feel anything on the mastectomy side all the way up to my armpit. Well, you won't have sensation over the nipple and the parts of your healthy boob with a smaller implant either. Well, no thank you. I just want a clean path report after surgery so I know I'll live. I don't have a road map for how to decide or how to get through this waiting. So I go to the Sharp Hospital Breast Support Cancer Group. Listen to what some of those ladies chose. Bald women, swollen face. But some look better, laughing, and eating pink turkey-shaped cookies for Thanksgiving week. One woman jumps up and says, here, pushing out her right breast under her black t-shirt. Come feel. It's not like a baseball. <laughs> I blushed. Maybe later. Thanks. <laughs> Another girl, a five-year survivor, drags me into the bathroom and pulls up her shirt. Not bad, huh? <laughs> she plants my hand right on her boob. Who knew cancer would mean feeling up so many boobs? <laughs> At work, I keep busy, but left to myself, late afternoon, I hunker down with the Food Network's Giada at home and her perfect makeup, her sliver of cleavage, all misty above a boiling pan of pasta sauce. Must be, <laughs> must be nice, Giada. Enjoy those while you can. <laughs> I give in to shopping. In Pier 1, towers of turquoise and silver ball ornaments sparkle from raised displays. Everything's peacock blue and feathery. I pile a basket with Thanksgiving stuff all the while thinking, how the fuck's this going to turn out, man? It's like trying on clothes when I'm in a bad mood. I put one shiny thing in the basket, and then I pull one out. I chose mastectomy with a sentinel node biopsy. No reconstruction for now. I want to heal and hear the lab results first. I'd had my breasts for 50 years, teenage blossoming, breastfeeding my child, and into womanhood. After making the decision, I spend a couple weeks getting ready for change. The surgeon's nurse tells me I'll have some drainage tubes and bandages. So find a nightgown that opens in the front. Turns out Nordstrom's lingerie department has a specialist. She looks like a college girl with a pink tape measure around her neck. She pops in my dressing room with a couple pink and white striped boxes. Alterations can sew a breast pocket into a bra, cami, or even a swimming suit. My eyes are on those boxes. 
She shows me a sample of a prosthetic breast in the naughty bra or cami. I order two boobs, <laughs> one for every day and one for my swimming suit in chlorine pools in the salty Pacific. In lighter moments, I think about boogie boarding again, the way a wave can rip off my swimsuit. What if someone finds a fake rubber boob floating around like a jellyfish? <laughs> On December 6, 2006, the night before my surgery, I double check the hospital list. No food or drink after 10. Bring insurance card and ID. No deodorant, no makeup, no jewelry. I pack the front opening gown, an iPod with downloads of nature sounds for relaxation, smashing pumpkins for my rage. <laughs> Amy Mann for Twisted Christmas Tunes. I bring an old eye mask from an overnight flight. I'm anticipating sharing a room, the kind where I'll hear other patients and their families through curves of curtains rounding the beds. Probably I'll be sitting there afterwards, bandaged up with my one boob, feeling like I'm in a cheap motel with thin walls. I'm done with the list. I sneak over to my bookshelf and I throw away some stuff in case I die on the operating table. <laughs> Old journals I never wanted anyone to read. <laughs> I get stuck leafing through the old hurts, the worries, the wishes of my 30s and 40s. I come across a line I'd inked in, Shakespeare's Hamlet. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I climb into bed beside Don. We spend a few minutes looking out the window at the twinkling lights of OB before pulling the drapes. He tells me he loves me, and not to worry about anything changing after the surgery. I believe him. He set the alarm for 4.30 a.m. <laughs> As I take my glasses off, I think, tomorrow, just before surgery, Don will be there. I'll give up my ID, my phone, and my glasses. Then I'll give up my breast. Nancy Carey, everybody.